great riches to the poor came the holy son of god a little child from the azure halls of heaven to a lowly manger stall jesus came and here he gave his life for all Saying, yet there is room 
there is room at my side for thee, and my heart shall rejoice, Lord Jesus, when thou comest to call us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know what you're doing. <coughs> and uh, I ask, Lord, that you take this, this time we have together and share with this, your people, the message that you'd have for them this day. And guide my thoughts to speak with clarity from heart to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps it's appropriate that today I'm down here and not up there. Not that my heart's any different there than it is here. But sometimes I think when you get a little closer, it's a little more personal. Don't know if that makes sense or not. Uh, and I, I say that because the events of this week, Kurt touched on them have uh, altered the normal activities and the normal thought patterns, I think, of all of us. Uh, and it altered my uh, message for today. Uh, I thought, I, I've been prepared for two weeks, next week I'll do what I was going to plan to do, maybe even a little different. But after the events of Friday, I, my thoughts were just, just saying, Lord, I find it hard for me to go where I was headed but to share from my heart what the Lord has placed on my heart, that that's what I'll share with you. I, th I think it's... Uh, actually, uh, when I heard the events of the things that happened on Friday, I was uh, actually preparing and planned and prepared to go to a memorial service. I wasn't going to be able to be here Friday night because I was going to be at a memorial service and I was going to be speaking at a memorial service. And as uh, my thoughts were thinking about that, then the events that happened on Friday and those things that I'll share with you in a little bit what transpired in, in my heart and my thinking and the timing, uh, but opened afresh this portion of scripture that we're going to end up thinking about here a little bit today. But I was going to a memorial service, and there are many memorial services being held today all over the country, from one end to the other, especially in Connecticut. Families gather together, and as they gather together to, to have their service, I was going to a memorial service, and the memorial service that I was going to was a memorial service where there, a brother had died, the family had gathered, and there was the source of comfort was to be spoken of that was the Lord. So I have us just to think about, I'm not sure even how much I'm going to read, but I do plan to share from the context of John chapter 11. There was a case where a brother had died, the family had gathered, and the source of comfort was present in the Lord Jesus Christ. The family member that died, a brother who died, was Lazarus. Lazarus had died. His body had been placed in the tomb. He'd been dead for four days. The decay process has already taken place. So a brother died. The family had gathered. Mary and Martha were there, and the friends had come. And they had gathered together there in the memory of the brother who had died. And they were there trying to comfort, to console, encourage one another. Their hearts were heavy. Their hearts were broken. Uh, and the sadness prevailed. So we have a brother who died. You had a family and the friends who had come together. And then we have the source of comfort. The source of comfort came from none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who had arrived at this scene. And there's much to be said about the text. We won't go into all the text. But when Jesus arrived, he saw their hearts. He saw they were broken. He saw the, wept, the weeping and all the things that were going on. And in the scripture, it says here that Jesus wept. 
And I wanted to think about the context here that Jesus wept. First of all, it said Jesus wept, but before he said that he wept, it said that he groaned in his spirit. He was troubled. He groaned in his spirit and he was troubled. And that context that he groaned in his spirit and he troubled was meaning that, that he was angry. The Lord was angry. As he arrived upon the scene, he saw what had happened. He saw the events of sin had entered in and his heart was touched and he was moved with anger. That's what he was talking about. He was groaned in his spirit. And I said this text opened up to me because as, as I was coming back, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I was turned on the radio for the first time, and I heard this broadcast. And as I heard the broadcast, and I began to hear the details unfold, as it talked about these small children, probably from the age of 5 through what, the 4th grade, my mind immediately went back to my own grandchildren. And I suppose yours did the same thing. Your children, your grandchildren. And I began to picture in my head, I couldn't help but picture in my head the events that unfolded in that place. And I began to see in my mind, and my mind didn't want to see it. And I saw the, in my mind, my heart, and my first emotion. Now, I don't know about your emotions. Yes, there was no doubt shock, grief, but then there was anger. How many had anger? Anger quickly rose to the occasion. And my heart was anger. I was angry with what had transpired there. I was angry with the innocence that had been destroyed there. And as I thought about that, here are these lives, these young children, their life, their innocence has been violated, been destroyed. Innocence no longer. Not only those whose lives had been taken, but the innocence of those who had to see those events. The innocence is gone. The innocence of those little children had been destroyed. I thought about that and the anger. And then I thought about what the Lord was experiencing here, probably even to a far greater degree. Because when God created man, He created man to be in perfect harmony with Him and with nature and with all things. All things were to be perfect. And He knew what the innocence was of humanity. But when sin entered in, that sin entered in, it brought death and destruction and sorrow. And that which God had ordained for humanity was wiped out. And now he sees the pain, the heartache, the struggles, and the agony that has been imposed as a result of the violation that has come. Sin violated that innocence. And as the Lord looks at that there, he looks with a sense of anger. And the text talks about his anger. So we see here in the text that I identified that anger on one scale that I had with what had taken place to the anger that the Lord has with the, the, that which has transpired in all of humanity, the anger. And as I thought about the anger, I also thought about the fact that one of the first things that comes out of it, somebody said, there should have been a law. There should have been a law. Then I thought about there should have been a law. But then my mind goes back to the scripture in the book of Deuteronomy. And I remember when God gave some laws to the, to the children of Israel. And in the Deuteronomy in chapter 5, He gave commands. And right after He gave the commandments. And then Moses was chosen to spoke to the people. And the people said, they said, Moses, you speak to us and we will hear and we will do it. We'll do what you say. And God gave ten perfect laws ten perfect commandments and this is what God said after the perfect law was given to mankind oh that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever God said, I gave you a command, and all oh, that they could adhere to that. Oh, the cry of the heart of God. In the book of Galatians, in chapter 2, in verse 21, it says, I do not make void the grace of God. 
For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He said, if it could have been a law, it should have been a law to fix it all. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 21, he says the same thing. He said, if there could have been a law given that could have given life, uh, righteousness, then surely it should have been by the law. If there could have been a law to make it right. In the book of Romans in chapter 8 and verse 3, it talks about, again, I'll read that. Romans chapter 8 verse 3 says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. There was nothing wrong with the law that existed. God gave us ten perfect laws. Where's the problem? The problem is in our flesh. The laws are perfect. The flesh is weak. And that's what he was saying. We have perfect laws. The perfect law of God had given to man. He gave it to us. But yet the flesh is weak. And what is hard for us to fathom is that there is evil in the land. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to acknowledge it. But there is sin in the land. There is evil in the land. And because of the weakness of the flesh, it manifests itself from time to time in many ways. We have laws that say, thou shalt not bear false witness. How many here would raise your hand and say, I have violated that law? Only a few of us. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not covet. How many have done that? I mean, we could go through all the commandments and say, I am guilty of all the laws. We can pass laws. But that doesn't do it. And the Lord looked with anger at what had happened, the devastation. And he knows that the flesh is weak. He knew men fail. The consequences of it. And as a result, their hearts were broke. Their hearts were heavy with sorrow. I've had funerals. And the worst funeral you could ever have, there's two. One is a suicide. And the other, and some of you have experienced it, is the death of a child. Two. And in the text it says Jesus wept. And in this context today it says he wept. He wept for them. He wept for Mary and Martha and those that gathered. He wept for them. His heart is touched with our grief. He weeps for them. Not only did he weep for them and the pain that they experienced, but it also said he wept and he wept with them. So he weeps for them, he weeps with them. Today, I believe the heart of our Lord is touched with our grief and he weeps for those whose hearts are broken. And he weeps with those whose hearts are broken. He does not stand aside, he identifies. And in this text we find that a short time thereafter he raised Lazarus from the dead. But yet then in a very short time after that, then he went all the way to the cross of Calvary. And there upon the cross of Calvary, he took his place. And he identified with us to take away the sin that had entered in. To pay the price, the ultimate price for sin. Here is the omnipotent, all-powerful Son of God, Son of Man, placed upon a cruel cross with nails probably about that big. Those were magic nails. They were magic nails. I say they're magic nails. There must have been magic in those nails because how could nails like that hold a holy, omnipotent, powerful Son of God upon a cross? He had the power to step aside at any moment. And all those nails didn't hold him there. What held him there? He experienced the pain, but he did not relent from the pain. He was held there by his love. And his love for us and his desire to remove all of our sin. To restore us back into relationship with him. It says in scripture, but God proved his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He stayed there for us. And then the scripture tells us then that they took him and they placed him there in the tomb. And the good news was, three days later, he came out from that tomb. He rose from the dead. And the significance of that for us is in many ways, 
One of the ways it is significant for us is this. By the fact that he rose from the dead, gave evidence that his offerings for our sin was accepted. Because you see, in the Old Testament, when the priest went in, if the sin offering was not accepted, then the priest did not come back out. He died, and you never saw him again. But he came back out. And as a result of the resurrection, it meant that your sins, my sin, our sin, the sins of humanity, that which angered him so much and separated people from God had been paid in full, and the Father said, it is sufficient. It's okay. And he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. He says, now I can give you this precious gift. And for all who receive it, he gives a gift. The gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So that was one thing we have. We know that the sin offering was accepted. We know this. There is life beyond the grave. There is that hope. There is life beyond the grave. This is not the end. We only see a bit of the picture. And this portion of the picture is horrifying. We don't see the other end of the picture when we see the glorified end, the end that he speaks about, that end where there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, where the saints of God will be there in a perfect body and all is well. It's a vision that, that is beyond my understanding. I can't understand what it would be like to be in a place and be in such a manner that it is sinless. <laughs> I think, Lord, you've got to give me a brain transplant here. Not only a body, but a brain and everything else. And he's going to do all of that. So I find here, one, the sin's been taken care of. If, if, I say if, we take advantage of it. It's offered, but we have to take advantage of it. Two, there is life beyond the grave. It is not the end. Three, it's a message of hope that he gave. Because he said, as he was leaving his disciples, he said, let not your heart be troubled. He said, you believe in God? Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it wasn't so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus made it very clear. We have hope. This is not the end. There is life beyond the grave. There's a new day coming. And when our loved ones go from here, we know that they're there. And we have this hope, according to Scripture, that everybody who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and with those who have gone before us. And we're going to meet them in eternity. It's going to be okay. We have that hope. And some people here are looking forward to that hope and wanting to go today. And they're saying, Lord, why am I here? I'm ready to go. Carl, you have to sit down. You can't leave yet. But we have a desire to go and to be with him, which is far better. So we have hope. So in this text, I'd, I'd, I'd seen here, as I thought about it, I saw this horrible event. My mind was taken into this event here. And as I thought about that horrible event, as it was 3 o'clock, I was telling you, 3 o'clock, and I was on the road, and I came back. And I was coming at 3 o'clock. And you know what happens about 3 o'clock as you drive through town? Buses, buses, and buses. And they stop, and children get out. And they stop, and children get out. But I noticed something when the bus stopped this time. And all the buses were lined up. I'd just gotten the news, and I'd seen the buses lined up and, and parked here. And I saw some kids getting out right across from uh, Wilson's over here, funeral home. As I saw them get out of the bus... And they walk over into that parking lot. I saw mamas grab those little babies and give them a big hug. Life is precious. And Jesus sees it all. So what do you say to people? First of all, they're going to cry out for new laws. God gave us perfect laws. The problem is not in the law. The problem is in the heart. And what we need is not new laws, but we need new hearts. And Christ died upon a cross of Calvary to give us a new heart. And with a new heart, a new life, a new direction, a new desires. 
And what the world needs is a new heart. We have the answer. And the new heart can be arrived at through him. Then we have this word. I, I, I think I share this today because I want us to take these out as tools. Perhaps you will find somebody this week. I'm sure the discussion will come. That we can take and, and take that which God has given to us and share with others. You say, yes, this is, I'm angry. Yes, sir. God is angry too. He's angry about what sin is. In fact, he was so angry about what sin did, he was willing to go to the cross to remove it, to pay for it. We celebrate the birth of Christ. He came to die to remove it, to what? Restore us to him. We have a message. It's not a law. It's a savior. The hope. So what do we say? We come to this. In Psalm 147 and verse 3, we studied it some time back. It said this. It says, he heals a broken heart and he binds up their wounds. He heals the broken heart. And I talked before and I said, how does God heal a broken heart? Does he bring these children back? No, that's not going to happen. Does he always fix that broken relationship? No, it doesn't always happen. So how does God heal the broken heart? He said he heals a broken heart. Here's how he heals a broken heart. He gives peace that passes understanding. He gives a peace that passes understanding, and only he can give it. God gives peace that passes understanding. But it said he binds up the wound. I put my head together here. He heals a broken heart and he binds a wound. Now, wait a minute. What's the distinction here? The broken heart, he gives me a peace that passes understanding. But he binding up of the broken, uh, of the wound is a process for healing now begins. You know what that means? People need to be aware of this. That he begins a process for healing. It means that that healing may not be instantaneously. I cut my finger doing something I shouldn't do. Dishes. Yeah. And when I cut it, I looked and wondered if I had a finger left by the time I got done. You never know. And I did. I kind of wiped it off. I didn't have a bandage that I could put on there to keep it. And I keep sticking my hands in places probably that shouldn't get there, and they keep coming off. And so, you know, this thing here has been a long process in healing. Uh, I finally got smart enough to put the kind of stuff in there to help the healing process. You know, and that's the way we are. We're not always too bright. I'm not always too bright. But the same thing spiritually. God has a provision for the healing process. He has an ointment that can help. And I didn't take advantage of any of that stuff. I put something on, then I gave up, and I didn't put anything on it. I just let it go, and people look at it and say, Oh, that doesn't look good. Oh, that doesn't look good. Well, it wasn't doing very good. Then finally... I got to look at it and say, you know, it really doesn't look very good and it's not healing very well. I think it needs some healing. So I went and got some stuff and I put some little stuff on there and put a little band-aid on there, you know, and you know, I checked it the last couple of days, you know, and, hey, it's getting better, getting better. But I put my hand back in the water and the band-aids all come off again, so I've got to go back to work through this process again. But you know what? When you put the right stuff on there, the, it doesn't instantly go back and heal itself. But the process for healing begins. And it says here that, that he binds the wounds. He puts them in the process for healing. So for a person to come up to a person who's just lost a child and expect them to be healed instantaneously, you've got another story to come. There is some anger. It's going to rage. It's going to vent. It's going to be like an open sore for a while. But somewhere along the way, they'll finally get to the point that they'll say, Okay, Lord, I, I need some of the ointment. I need some of the process for healing. And you put it on with the Band-Aid and give it some time and the grace of God to work to bring the healing. And he's the only one that could bring healing. And then it went ahead to say this. 
The one who heals a broken heart, who binds the wounds, he appoints a number of stars and he calls them all by names. Meaning that he knows every individual circumstance. He knows every individual name. If he named all the stars, he knows our names. He knows the names of every child. He knows the name of every parent. He knows the name of every heartache. Not only does he know the name, but he knows the need. And the one who says he'll heal the broken heart, he'll bind the wounds, and he knows the name, he is the one who's seated at the right hand of God the Father today. And this is our message in part that we have to carry to others is that we have a Savior who's seated there who knows everything about everything. And he's there in a position to help us. He's sympathetic to where our pain level is, as I've talked about here, the anger that we have. He had it too. He understood it. And he groaned. And he's the one to whom he says, come to me to find the grace to help in your hour of need. And this is the hour of need for the people that you and I walk amongst. I don't live in Washington, D.C. I can't touch those people. If I was there, I would. I'd need the grace of God to keep my hands off of some. But I say that to say, you know, we can't fix the outer line areas. But God has, just as he put the stars where they are, He's put you where you are, around the people to whom you have to deal with. They're going to be talking about this situation for the days to come. Their hearts are going to rage with anger. And we have a message. And the message is anger is to be recognized. Our Lord was angry. And He did something about it. He did what He could to remove it. And He can bring healing. He is our help. We need to come to Him. Open our hearts to Him. Be honest with Him. Don't lie to God. How many have lied to God? (laughs) Yeah. In fact, I just read to Shelly in here one. She was up here working away, having a big time and a fun time. And I said, oh, wow, you've got to look at this stuff here in the Psalms. This is really great stuff. You know, and I said, here, we've been studying that stuff. You know, and she's going on, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just happened to read a portion of Scripture and says, Lord, help me not to lie to myself. Oh, she said, that speaks to me. You say, well, how could you lie to yourself? We don't want to face the truth. And we don't want to be honest with God. God already knows. We need to be honest. Be open. Be honest. Pour out our hearts. Let him know. And then to the extent that you and I are able, share with others. There is a source. It is our Lord. Yes, evil happens. Part of me says I don't want to admit it. Because we've been insulated in some ways. We haven't had very many murders in the town of Gray. Maybe a couple I can think of in 30 years. When it happens, it's a shock. If there's a virtue to this, if there's a virtue to this, that we're not calloused and desensitized by it. We're shocked. This happened every day. It would be like profanity on TV. How many remember the first time the profanity started to come to TV? Raise your hand. This got to be old now. All right. And what kind of response was there? There was a hubbub. There was all kinds of indignation. There was all kinds of stuff going on. Now, have you heard profanity on TV? What kind of a hubbub is there now? We've become desensitized. If there is a virtue, it doesn't happen every day. That doesn't make it right, and it doesn't make it good. 
folks, we do have an answer. We do have an answer. Our Lord identifies. He understands. He knows. So in the text, we had a situation. A brother died. A family gathered. A source of comfort. And he is our comfort today. Thank you.